Now, I know almost all of you have already read this play. Many of you have even read it with me in Intro to Lit. So for a lot of you, this is going to be like your third time through the play. Sorry. But not really. It's a really great play. There's so much going on here. And I think as far as themes or character types or even genre conventions, this play closes so many of the loops we've been exploring in this class. Class distinctions, gender dynamics, problems with social expectations and roles, problematic marriages passed off with happy endings. This play kind of addresses all of our problems. It's one of the last plays Shakespeare wrote, so 1610-ish. Maybe the very last one, even, or at least the last one he wrote on his own. After this, old Bill's going to bring on John Fletcher as an apprentice. Remember that name, Fletcher, will be a collaborator on the last of Shakespeare's works. And he becomes a very well-known playwright in his own right. I want to try to cover a lot of ground today. I'd like to unpack some parts of The Tempest and start discussing some key elements of a new genre for us, the tragic comedy. But I also want to get a few words in on the 1956 film Forbidden Planet. Let's see how it goes. So, The Tempest. What's the plot? There's a storm, and the king, and the prince, and the duke, and a bunch of other dudes are about to get drowned because Prospero sent Ariel to come to their ship. But then Miranda is like, well, hang on, this is this too much. This is too confusing. Let's go back a little. What's the premise? Prospero, Duke of Milan, but he doesn't really like doing any of that pesky duke stuff, you know, like ruling a region or enacting laws. He just wants to sit around reading all the time. So he leaves all the duking to his brother, Antonio, and, God, that ungrateful jerk, Antonio starts to think he should be the duke, since Prospero has, well, made him the duke. Only way to really make that happen is to get rid of Prospero. Easy. Let's go round that dude up and drop him off on an island someplace in the middle of the Mediterranean. Let him take his daughter, Miranda, age three, and some books to keep him busy. Fast forward 12 years, Miranda is 15, and Prospero has learned all kinds of magic from that book he brought along. And he's effectively conquered the little island and made its inhabitants, Ariel, an air spirit, and Caliban, half fish, half human, his slaves. Well, wouldn't you know it, but Prospero gets word that his brother Antonio is traveling with the king of Naples, Alonso, and his son, Prince Ferdinand, and a bunch of other dudes from Milan to Tunisia, which will take him right past his little island. So Prospero hatches a scheme. I'll get Ariel to whip up a storm and dump everybody overboard and have them wash up on shore in different places on the island. We'll make sure the boat stays intact and can just chill on the far side of the island where no one will see it. Once Ferdinand, the prince, is isolated, I'll introduce him to Miranda and make them fall in love and get married right away. So as soon as they do, bam, the ship will show back up and take us back to Naples where Ferdinand will inherit his father's throne, Miranda will be queen, and the recently vacated dukedom of Milan will need to be filled. And who better than me, good old Prospero, who has former Duke of Milan on his resume? Bonus, the usurping Antonio and all those other dudes will be stuck in the island. So poetic justice. Sounds like a good plan. It's pretty skeevy and conniving, but solid. But it doesn't work out that way. Why not? Well, the main reason is because it's evil. I mean, it's all retributive. There's no mercy, no grace, no peace. Just power exercising power over power. In the end, nothing changes. If Antonio is wrong for usurping the dukedom of Milan, then usurping the dukedom of Milan from him doesn't make things any better. It's just more of the same. There's still a usurper on the throne. Things can't go that way. At least not if you want a good tragic comedy. See, the whole point of the tragic comedy is to bring together two incompatible genres, tragedy and comedy. I mean, it's in the name. From the tragedy, we get high-born characters with flawed actions that unravel entire political systems. Hamartia, some kind of sin that cracks open the whole social order and exposes the frailty of the status quo. We also get something of the conflicting ethical systems that bind the hero in a state of inaction. In this case, vengeance and forgiveness. From the comic world, though, the main thing we get in the tragic comedy is reconciliation, the happy ending. Rather than death and failure, we have marriage and harmony. So if Prospero goes through with his plan, the tragic flaw, we don't get any true reconciliation. We might get a false reconciliation with a sham arranged marriage built on deceit and Prospero the king killer, Richard III, is his way back into power, but we wouldn't have any change to the status quo that led to this time. Without a substantial change to the underlying causes of these conditions, they're bound to repeat again. And that's no way to end a tragic comedy. As a side note, there are a lot of scholars who will paint Prospero as something of a villain. There's good reason for this. He's very controlling of his daughter in really creepy ways. Their first scene together, he gets tired of her asking questions and knocks her out with magic. Right? He says this is early in, in Act 1, Scene 2. Here, cease more questions. Thou art inclined to sleep. Tis a good dullness, and give it way. I know thou canst not choose. Yeesh. I know thou canst not choose. This is an early and very direct indication that Prospero takes the liberty of controlling his daughter's body. Later in the play, he gives Ferdinand some pretty explicit instructions on what not to do with his daughter's virginity. 
Uh, this is Act 4, Scene 5, right after the betrothal. Uh, he's passed all the trials and everything, and Prospero turns to Ferdinand and says, Then is my gift and thine own acquisition worthily purchased. Take my daughter. First of all, yuck. Miranda is his property, and Ferdinand has basically bought her off of him. Let's not excuse this as some kind of historical short-sightedness. Evil is evil, even when it's culturally accepted. And selling your daughter is evil. But if thou dost break her virgin not before all sanctimonious ceremonies, may with full and holy rite be ministered, no sweet aspersion shall the heavens let fall to make this contract grow. But barren hate, sour eyed disdain, and discord shall bestrew the union of your bed with weeds so loathly that you shall hate it both. So if their horniness gets the best of them before they can have a full marriage ceremony with church and rites and witnesses, he's cursing their baby making. The contract won't grow, right? Gestation. They won't conceive. They'll, they'll have barren hate instead. Their sex life will be no good. They're going to have weeds in the marriage bed. This is definitely an overreaching control of his daughter's sexuality. Still, some people might say he's just trying to be a good father and protector. But that's still problematic. As we've seen in a number of the films we've watched for this class, there's a tendency for us to try to excuse patriarchy as long as the patriarch is nice enough. That kind of benevolent patriarchy, though, doesn't solve the root problem of mastery. One person still ruling over the bodies of others. That's the other major problem literary critics have with Prospero, by the way. He's a slave maker. He finds this island inhabited with all sorts of brave beings, and what does he do? He uses his superior knowledge, the tricks and technologies of his own culture to enslave them as servants. Ariel, who seems mostly to listen to his master, still gets some pretty serious threats. So the situation is that Ariel has agreed to serve Prospero for a time because Prospero freed him from imprisonment. Sycorax, the witch, who's Caliban's mother, the previous castaway on the island, had locked him into a pine tree. Bad news for an air spirit. Well, Prospero freed him from that, and in exchange, Ariel became a servant for a short time. When he reminds him that the contract is up, Prospero turns to threats. If thou more murmurest, I will rend an oak and peg thee in his naughty entrails till thou hast howled away twelve winters. Dang, Ariel, you thought what Sycorax did was bad. Dude, just wait till I get a hold of you. Prospero maintains his authority with violence and threats of violence. Now, this is way more evident with Caliban, the malcontent slave on the island. And honestly, malcontent for good reason. Dude was living his best life before Prospero came along. He's chilling, eating berries, living off the land. Now Caliban is basically responsible for the grunt work on the island. The first time we see him, he's just trying to have some dinner when Prospero shows up and demands he move around some firewood. Caliban's having none of it. He says, This, this island, island is mine! By Sycorax, my mother, which thou takest from me. When thou camest first, thou strokest me and made much of me. Wouldst gave me water with berries in it, and teach me how to name the bigger light, and how the less that burn by day and night. Then I loved thee, and showed thee all the qualities of the isle. The fresh springs, brine pits, barren place and fertile. Cursed be I that did so. All the charms of Sycorax, toads, beetles, rats, that on you. For I am all the subjects that you have, which first was my own king. Here you tie me in this hard rock, whilst you do keep from me the rest of the island. He has right to be angry. I was my own king, and you made me a slave. There's no doubt that behind all this, we're getting commentary on the African slave trade. The African slave trade began at the tail end of the 15th century. It runs parallel to European colonization of Africa. Those two things, both historically and theoretically, always go hand in hand. When colonists seek to plant themselves in a new land, they do so by displacing the people already living there building new systems literally on the backs of people who once lived freely in that place. This is certainly something that's on Shakespeare's mind, on, on everyone's mind in the period. And most of the energy from the church and the state is spent trying to find ways to justify and legitimize colonization, usually in theological language. The point is that Caliban is a slave and comes into the story in relation to African colonialism. Remember, the king of Naples was on his way to Tunisia when this place started. Caliban is more than just a fish monster. He's the avatar of dehumanized native peoples, forced into slavery by European colonialist systems that framed themselves as Christian truth. But wait a second, wait a second. Caliban isn't some kind of noble, savage, rightful king who does no wrong. Dude tried to rape Miranda. Prospero responds to him, the most lying slave, whom stripes may move, not kindness. I have used thee, filth as thou art, with human care, and lodged thee in mine own cell. 
Tell us did seek to violate the honor of my child. Look, I tried being nice to you, dude, and you tried to rape my daughter. Caliban doesn't deny this. He laughs about it instead. So Caliban, it seems, is just as bad as Prospero when it comes to taking advantage of Miranda's body. In fact, we might say that control over Miranda's sexuality is a cipher for mastery over the island itself. The dominant power gets to have Miranda. But heck, where do you think Caliban learned this language of control? Well, from the same place he learned all his other language, from Prospero himself. Caliban says he taught him to name the greater light and how the less. So give him terms for things like sun and moon, but more than that, name them greater and less. Embedded in Prospero's education system is his basic structure of sovereignty. Some things are great, some things are less. Prospero sun, Caliban moon. Caliban's attempted rape of Miranda is his attempt to act out the same control he's seen Prospero himself use. as an attempt to gain rulership over the island. Okay, so that's a pretty damning picture of Prospero. He's a power-hungry, controlling, manipulative, violent slave maker. Not much of a hero, and he does sound more like a villain. But what's all this got to do with reconciliation? If the tragic comedy must end in reconciliation and structural transformation of the social order, how does Prospero and all his misdeeds fit into that? Well, the folks who focus on Prospero's villainy have some good points, but I think they haven't really read the end of this play. It's remarkable, actually. Prospero changes. He repents. He, he deplatforms himself, and more than that, he makes amends. There's a really important scene. Prospero's whole plan has worked out more or less how he envisioned it, and he's just about to go punish the nobles and his usurping brother, who he's trapped and driven mad by Ariel. Ariel tells him that these guys are so distraught and so full of sorrow that if you now beheld them, your affections would become tender. And Prospero's like, ha, huh, you think so? And Ariel drops this bomb on him. He says, mine would, were I human. Look, Prospero, you don't realize it, but all this control, all this manipulation, all this violence, it's destroying your humanity too. To deny the humanity of another person doesn't just violate them, it violates you, maybe even more than them. To be a slave is to be forced to follow unjust rules and coerced into acting in a dehumanized system. But to be the master is to choose the system, to choose the rules, to choose the violence. Prospero, by your actions here, you are losing your humanity. If you want it back, it takes repentance. It means turning from anger and violence and control. Look, Prospero gets it now. He tells Ariel, the rarer action is in virtue than in vengeance. Go release them, Ariel. My charms I'll break, their senses I'll restore, and they shall be themselves. And then as Ariel runs off to free the prisoners, Prospero turns to the audience and says, this rough magic I hear abjure, and when I have required some heavenly music, which even now I do, to work mine end upon their senses, this airy charm is for, I'll break my staff, bury it certain fathoms in the earth, and deeper than ever did plummet sound, I'll drown my book. His last act of power is to order the release of the prisoners, the heavenly music that will restore their senses, and then he'll cut off all his power. He'll drown the book, the, the law, the rules, the canon that has justified and legitimized his own power. He'll break the staff. It's a phallic symbol, sure, for one thing, but also a representation of a king's scepter. It's the tool he's used to keep his slaves in line. This is Prospero turning his back on all of it. Patriarchy, power, sovereignty, colonialism, everything. And at the very moment that, arguably, he needs them the most. He's almost done with his plan. He could say, I'll throw this all away as soon as I get my dukedom back, or, or as soon as I punish my evil brother, or, or even as soon as we're safely off this island. Nope, none of that. At the most crucial time in his plan, he gives it all up. So what does this mean for reconciliation? Well, for one thing, it puts him in a place to genuinely make things right with his brother. That was the root cause of all this suffering in the first place. But instead of repaying evil with violence, he forgives. Ariel, he sets free, no strings attached. Miranda probably ends with the best deal of the whole bunch. She gets married to the future king, who is also, by all accounts, pretty dreamy. She marries a man she's in love with. This isn't an arranged marriage that she likely would have had as the daughter of a duke, and it has nothing to do with her father's plan. In fact, it almost ruins everything for Prospero. Uh, he was going to try and zap Ferdinand into falling in love, but before he can, the two fall in love on their own. It's so easy, in fact, for them that he's actually going to make things more difficult by, by buying himself some time. But even more than that, Ferdinand is like the antithesis to Prospero. He's willing to suffer to be near to her rather than making her suffer to be near to him, as Prospero does. He's reluctant to claim the crown, even after he thinks his father is dead, rather than usurping authority the way Prospero does. When Prospero's going on and on and on about breaking her virgin knot, he's like, dude, I wasn't even thinking about that. If it's not clear enough already, we still get this final moment with Ferdinand and Miranda at the very end. 
Everything's been reconciled, books drowned, staff broken, and Tony forgiven and prosper with company. Find Miranda and Ferdinand alone in the bedroom behind a curtain playing chess. Actual chess. This is an innuendo. Trust me, Shakespeare knows how to do innuendo. This is an actual game of actual chess. Chess, a game in which the queen is the most powerful piece on the table. In the period, chess was seen as the great equalizer between men and women. There's no advantage to any gender here. And so it became a symbol, a shorthand for equality between men and women. And while they're playing, Ferdinand is talking about how he wouldn't dare cheat on her for all the kingdoms in the world. What a mensch. Miranda ends up in an egalitarian marriage with the most powerful person in the world. And he's hot. She wins. Really, the only person who doesn't get a full redemption is Caliban. But that's way trickier. The tragic reality is that there is no undoing colonialism. We can't just drown the book and then pretend there's no harm done. There's so much to it, and this is way too quick, but two things stand out to me. First, Caliban is left on the island. If he was once his own king, he can be again. But second, on Prospero's part, there's this line at the end, right? Trinculo, Stefano, and Caliban have all been captured. They're brought before the nobles, and Prospero explains their plan to kill him and rule the island. But Prospero also seems to recognize that this plan is strikingly similar to his own. Again, Caliban learned everything he knows about the world from Prospero. Then he says, two of these fellows, so Stefano and Trinculo, you, Alonzo, must know and own. So these guys are your problem. Then, this thing of darkness, I acknowledge mine. I don't think he's talking about complexion here. The thing of darkness that Prospero is referring to is not merely Caliban, but the training and violent mastery that he's indoctrinated Caliban into. This thing of darkness, this terrible deed that I have performed against this person that has led to the place where my own life is at risk, I acknowledge my part. This is huge. Reconciliation, rather than seeking to erase the wrongs done in the past, acknowledges them, takes account of them. Prospero bears witness to his own misdeeds. See, if we make Prospero out to be only this one-dimensional villain that he plays in the first four acts, we're going to miss a whole lot of really important messages this play contains. This doesn't excuse Prospero's actions in the rest of the play, not at all. But it does say that Prospero can be reconciled too. And if he can, then I can. Look, listen, I inherited a lot of screwed up ideas. I was told a lot of wrong things were right and I was given a long list of justifications for those things. But the process of my life has been learning how to unlearn all those inherited evils. And man, I still got a lot of blind spots, but if Prospero can get better, then so can I. And so can you. The promise of this play, and the really rich, all-encompassing flood of reconciliation it grants, is that even the worst of us can get better. But there's one final move this play makes before we can walk out of the theater. The rest of the cast fall back, and Prospero steps forward to address the audience one last time. Look, you guys, you aren't out of this yet. Because if this thing is going to work, if we're really going to get rid of all these oppressive systems of patriarchy and power, I'm going to need your help. Look, I've given up my power. I, I can't get us home. And if we can't get home, then it's all for nothing. There's one final thing, and it requires all of you to step into this together with me. One voice, one motion, and send us all home. Now my charms are all overthrown, and what strength I have is my own, which is most faint. Now tis true I must be here confined by you, or sent to Naples. Let me not, since I have my dukedom, God, and pardon the deceiver, dwell in this bare island by your spell. But release me from my bands with the help of your good hands. Gentle breath of yours my sails must fill, or else my project fails, which was to please. Now I lack spirits to enforce, art to enchant, and my ending is despair, unless I be relieved by prayer which pierces so that assaults mercy itself and frees all faults. As you from crimes who pardon be, let your indulgence set me free. Wait, 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 no, come back, come back, come back. I forgot. I wanted to talk about Forbidden Planet. This is a weird movie. It offers us some new ideas about what we can mean by adaptation. I mean, is this an adaptation? As a side note, The Tempest is one of the only plays by Shakespeare that isn't based on an earlier story. It's a true original. And Forbidden Planet, at least from all appearances, doesn't seem to be trying to adapt Shakespeare's play at all. Uh, there's no, no based on the play The Tempest in the title cards. There's no nod in the press release or the posters or any other promotional material. Instead, the credits point to a completely different story by Irving Block and Alan Adler. That was actually a, an unpublished screenplay for a different film altogether that never got made. Still, the first reviews pointed out the major similarities in plot between the film and Shakespeare's The Tempest. 
Is this one of those like so obvious we don't need to say it things? Or a uh, uh, whoops, we accidentally copied one of the most well-known works of English literature types of things? Uh, it's hard to know. And really, either way we take it, it's not very satisfying. If it's an adaptation, why not say so? And why take such drastic liberties with the story? If it's not an adaptation, then... Dang, are you sure it's not an adaptation? I mean, all the characters line up so perfectly. You got Morbius Prospero, Alta Miranda, Commander John J. Adams Ferdinand, Robbie the Robot, Ariel. There's even a representation of the dark side of power manifesting as the colonized subject, Caliban, the monster from the id. At the same time, well, so much is radically different. There's no usurpation as the plot's motivation. We have discovery and exploration as the motivation instead. Prospero, or, or Morbius, isn't the main character, but Adams, the Ferdinand character, is. Even more than that, the movie is in no way interested in reconciliation or forgiveness, but in, gosh, what? Nuclear anxiety, post-war toxic masculinity, a little bit of bastardized Freudian psychoanalysis to round things off. But what's going on here? Well, as you watch this movie, and start to unpack it, watch for the palimpsest, sure, but also watch the film for what it's doing in its own right. Okay, now you can go. Now fade out.